Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special episode of Take One. Today, I am joined by Sarah Greenwood and Katie Spencer, production designer and set decorator who have worked together in a bunch of different movies. They work together in movies such as Pride and Prejudice, Atonement, the Guy Ritchie Sherlock Holmes movies, Anna Karenina, the live action remake of Beauty and the Beast, The Darkest Hour, and most recently, they work together on a small indie movie. You might have heard of it, a little movie called Barbie. You know, who am I kidding? Barbie took the world by storm back in the summer and it is currently the highest grossing film of 2023. So the first thing I'll say is, Sarah and Katie, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Lovely, Lovely to be here. here. Yeah. Now, the second thing I'll say is correlations. I generally believe that some of the sets that you guys built for Barbie are some of the greatest movie sets in film history and some of the greatest that I've ever seen. I mean, Barbie's dream house in and of itself is just a set so amazing that it was featured in Architectural Digest. So absolutely incredible that the cast of Fast and Furious would just go chill in the set while they were on break while filming Fast X. How insane is that? And also a set so intricately crafted that fans around the world are just clamoring for it to be turned into a museum or a theme park of some sort. That said, you know, Barbie's Dream House is just one out of the many sets that you guys built for this movie. You guys also build the Weird Barbie's House, which is also absolutely incredible. Ken's Mojo Dojo Casa House, of course. The beach, you know, the Barbie Land Congress, the beautiful tableaus that the characters travel through when they're going to and from Barbie Land, which, ah, just gorgeous. And then, you know, even the Mattel headquarters, which feature, like, a joke that is fully based on set design, you know, when they compare the Mattel headquarters to the FBI or the CIA. Absolutely loved it. So, once again, correlations. Thank you very much. I think you definitely watched it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I watched it, I rewatched it, and I loved it. <laughs> uh... Okay, now let's jump right into the question. And before we dive into Barbie land, let's first start with a more general question. And that question would be, what does it mean to be a production designer and a set decorator? Well, I'm the production designer, Casey's the set decorator. But um, interestingly, I, mean, I think it's more, it's more about kind of how we work particularly. You know, we've worked together for 25 odd years. I think we are, it's true. Yeah, about that. A long time. And, you know, it's kind of like we both we both started in the theatre. You it, and in theatre, the, the relationship between the designer and the director is an interesting one and, a, and one you can't put a piece of paper in between because there's, it's, it kind of is so merging. And I think that's maybe the way we approach our work is it's, it's very, you know, it is it, conceptually at the beginning, it's very much about talking about it and about conceiving it and what it's about. And, you know, then once we get into the how and the why and the practicality of it, you know, we maybe take on a more traditional roles, but... Mm. You know, I think to begin with, it's it's very collaborative and very communicative. It's the only way it, it can work, actually. Otherwise, it's too hard. Yeah, and, and in it, and it, and its simplest sense, it's really just taking what's um, what's written. You know, we have a thing that you know, it's like a it's like a there's a blank space before anything is done. You know, before you know, it literally is is taking what's written on the page and putting it into a visual sense mm -hmm. and then creating it. Which is quite hard. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and interestingly, you know, with 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 this one, I mean, we had the most amazing script from from Greta and a uh, phenomenal script. But you know, the the first draft that we read, it, it had no scene breaks in it. You know, it was it was just a a stream of consciousness, and it broke the fourth wall. It would talk at you. It would say things like, you know, well, on the first page, it said, "Oh, don't worry." Studio executives, don't worry about the fact that this script is 140 pages long because all the actors are going to speak very fast. <laughs> you know, so, so so she's going, you know, so you're 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 you you're figuring out something that is not a conventional uh, approach or a conventional script, and you what you're going to end up with is not a conventional film. And you know, I think it's a, it is you know in the same way as kind of Pal and Pressburger, you know, doesn't have. This kind of particular genre. It's a kind of genre breaking film. It's not, you can't pigeonhole it. You can't classify it. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. You can't put this Barbie into a box. And I think that's part of its appeal, yeah. you know, because it is that sort of cross genre like that. And an assortment of people, all strangers, have really loved it. Some have not liked it as well, to be fair. Mm -hmm. Some have not have taken against it. But. Yeah. but I mean, I think as well, interestingly, you could you say put, put this Barbie back in the box. The box was quite a kind of symbolic. Uh, kind of piece of imagery that we worked with a lot. You know, we talked about, mm. you know, to the extent that, you know, 
it, it, it did want to be disappointing. And, you know, we go back to Christmases where you get this amazing present. You want this thing, you want this thing, and it's in the box. And you're so excited. You've unwrapped it. It's in the box. It's in the box. You get it out of the box, and it's disappointing. Mm. And actually, the thing that this had to be when in the conversations with Greta was that this is not a disappointment. It has to be, you know, it has to be better than you ever expected for it, what it would be. You know, it's just better than what what you imagine. So no pressure there. No, really. <laughs> when we were around the blank table with Greta, yeah, literally it's saying it's got to have the feel of the best ever Christmas present. Yeah, yeah. And okay. also, you know, it comes out of the box, and it's you know, it's all those things that you know we were talking earlier about the, the whole idea of kind of you give yourselves way in, you give yourself keys, you know, and the whole one of the things was that it was coming out of this. It was in a hermetically sealed box. It has no, it has no air. It has no wind. It has no elements. It has no water. It has no electricity. And it just there's all these things it doesn't have. So you kind of go, well, what does it have? You know, what are we going to make this film out of? You know, so it was good though. That set the parameters. That once you have the parameters in place, you stick by them, and that's how you start to build up. Amazing. Thank you so much. Now, I guess let's go into the second question, and that is, I do have to confront you about something. Yeah. And that is the case because apparently you two are responsible for the world running out of paint. Apparently, creating the sets for Barbie took up so much pink paint that you guys created a global paint shortage. So my question is, how does it feel to know that your sets created a global paint shortage? Well, I think once, once that shortage has been created... I don't think the film wasn't out, so I don't think that many people really wanted pink. No. Now we didn't, you know, there might be another pink shortage now the film's out, but yeah. yeah. No, I think it was um I mean that was that was as you say, one of the first one of the first interviews we did was with with Architectural Digest and it was a slightly off the cuff comment from me about, you know, um that we ran out of pink paint. But in fact, what happened was we had difficulty getting enough pink paint to do the set. Huh. Um, because uh up to this point, there isn't a huge demand for that kind of quantity and, you know, density of pink. Um, and uh, uh, the company that we, you know, the f supplies the film industry, a company called Roscoe, who also does all the gels and things like that. Um, you then go, what? How many litres of this pink pigment do you want? You know, and it was like, yeah, we did cause a kind of a, a bit of a, a bit of a shortage because the, because the, because of the demands of the film, but um, I'm sure there's enough pink paint left. I think now. I yeah. think, or maybe they're mixing more now. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they are. <laughs> the demand is up once again. Uh, but no, fascinating story. I remember reading the headline before the movie came up and being like, "Yeah, yeah." But yeah, it was yeah. it was a true it was yeah. a true, but it was a true story. True, true story. Yeah, oh, that's, yeah. that's lovely. Yeah. That makes yeah. it even better. Yeah. Uh, now, I guess my following question is: What are some of the challenges you faced when designing sets inspired by real life toys? And did you take any creative freedoms when designing these? I mean, I think, I think, as you say, the way we work is always from character and we, we interpret a story. We don't like directly reproduce. So there were so many challenges and, you know, we was, we talked earlier about the philosophical questions that you ask yourself on Barbie. It's the hardest, probably one of the hardest ones we've ever done. And that question is really, what is a toy? What makes a toy? You know, and what makes a toy? What is a humanity within the toy? So that was really difficult. And we knew that it was all going to be in camera. But to keep this toyness was hard. And there were a few things. That we'd never had a Barbie, never had a Barbie dream house. We bought one, didn't we, in prep? Mm. And for the first time. And through that, we, we worked out scale and all of that. You had a very, you, Sarah, had a very strong feel of, you know, you, this mid-20th century American aesthetic. Um, uh, and the key things from Greta were it's just got to be beautiful. It's just got to be beautiful. And sometimes you look at these plastic toys and they come out and they're in these very sort of crude and strong colours. Colour was a huge thing. Scale was a huge thing. Um, the absence of things. What would you say? Yeah, I mean, I think it was, you know, I think, I think we weren't recreating a Mattel toy. You know, the other thing is that you, you, had, you had all the Barbie dream houses throughout the period, you know, um, and it was kind of what what we what we ended up with was telling our story was for our our characters in our film. We are not making a toy. We are not recreating a Mattel toy. You know, so you're kind of hybriding it. You're you're pulling you're pulling you know all sorts of references 
from Mattel, but also from, as Katie said, you know, mid-century modern, Slim Aarons, Palm Springs, you know, there's lots of, there's lots of references in there. Um, and what it has to do is it has to feel like a toy and trying to capture that, what is it that makes it feel like a toy? And it, it was to do with scale, it was to do with, um, you know, things like what happens, you know, and this is a great thing that, that Greta did, you know, when she had the, when she had the dolls is, you know, in the first question is, are they going to be jointed? Are we going to be, you know, are they going to be seated? No, 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 <laughs> don't be silly. But you've got to get into her head. But, you know, when she talks about the way that they are, you know, when you see Mar Margot and Ryan and, you know, it's when they go and, and they go for the kiss and it's like, what do dolls do? What do dolls do when they kiss? You know, is that a question? And it's kind of like, you know, like when he runs down the beach and he hits the wave and he spins in the air. Because that's what you do when you're playing with your toy. You just take it and you spin. You know, and it's capturing those moments, and it's not, they're not, those aren't moments that have to be there every other shot. You know, you just use them very sparingly, and you know, that's how you, that's how you create. Um, and it's like, it's like the kilt, and you know, Gresta, we just do it a couple of times, like the giant hairbrush in the beginning, the toothbrush, you know, and then people will believe. And of course, amazing thing, Margot steps out of the shoe and her foot is still up. Yeah. Yeah. And then we just follow her, you know, for the rest of it. And so it's that Grechtian suspension of disbelief, really. It's like a theatrical moment. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, it's, it's, like, it's, it's like once everybody finds, finds and understands those way in, you, 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 know, you know what you're doing. But it does take, it looks simple now and straightforward, and of course. But actually to get to that point is... Yeah, Easy. we even said when we were doing it, said if, if if we in any way get this right, it should look like the simplest thing on earth. Yeah, you know, it really should. It shouldn't look complicated. No, but it was, it was. to get to. Yeah, yeah. I love that you guys really succeeded in nailing the feel of a toy, and that brings me to my next question, which is, you know, of course, there are many details in the set of Barbie that make the set feel like you know the real dream houses that we know and love. There are no stairs. There is hardly any, there are hardly any walls. There is no running water. And the pole looks like a giant sticker. So my question is, are there any other minor details that haven't been talked about all that much or that maybe were caught out of the movie that you guys are particularly proud of? I think a huge thing, I think it has been spoken about, but, and it's imperceptible, is the use of stickers or decals as, you know, we never... American. American. We'd, no. we'd never... Do you call them decals call in them Canada? Call them decals? Decals? Ah, oh, you don't. you <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm from Colombia, so uh, there's okay. a translation happening. So there's one of this one, you know, decals. So decals is a sticker, basically. Um, but we like the, the word decal because, you know, it feels like it should have its own, you know, department and, you know, all of that and a special <laughs> building and everything. And uh, so the use of decals, like in the fridge, on the car, on the lights, on all over the place. I think, I think that's another imperceptible moment that it makes you feel, oh, you think, oh, I get it, I get it, but it's not too distracting. I'll get it for that moment and then move on. So I think the decals yeah. work really well. Yeah. Well, they're also, they're also on the palm trees. They're on the palm trees. Yep. You know, and uh, and I think for for, for I mean for me going back to going back to uh, what's in the box. You know, it's like it's like um, the idea of. You know that everything was in camera. That was a very important thing for Greta, and this this idea of this kind of this perspective, this false perspective, mm. and hyper realism. You know, authentic artificiality. You know, the fact that everything up to the garden wall was three dimensional. Then over the garden wall, it started to become two dimensional. Then it got went down in scale, and then you know you had the mountains and you had the sky. You know, so it's it's you know that that. You know, so it had this real toy-like quality, but a kind of authenticness about it, which was really very... Once you'd done it, you go, oh, God, yeah, that's obvious, isn't it? But it, it wasn't. Yeah, and I kind of like, which people perhaps don't know so much, though, so each house had a mailbox that was a different bird, and of course, yes. stereos in Bob Barbie had the flamingo. But in the back of that were all, all the electric chargers for the cars. So we did shoot it with the car being charged. Yeah, sometimes called the cars were electric. Yeah. I don't think that made it through in the end, but I thought that was quite sweet. That male one side in empty chance. Yeah. That is fantastic. Uh, okay, I think you already answered my next question, so let's skip right into six, uh, which is what would you say are the key differences between Weird Barbie's house and the other Barbie dream houses? Well, the whole thing about Weird Barbie is that Weird Barbie kind of grew out of uh, being, well, didn't they, they say that she was the most beautiful Barbie? She was. She yeah. was a, you know, yeah. um, still was, still is. Still is, you know, yeah. Um, 
So uh, Weird Barbie is the Barbie that everybody's had and played with too much and cut the hair, burnt the hair, stuck nail varnish all over. We all love Weird Barbie. Yeah, we all like Weird Weird Barbie. So Weird Barbie for us was, um, you know, the the house is based on a a dream house, but it's like it's gone cockeyed, really. So it's kind of, you know, it's gone from being very square and perfect and 90-degree angles and things like that. There isn't one square angle in it. It's all, all over the shop and... And it's on top of this little hillock, and it's like it's we we refer to it as like the Boo Radley house of Barbie Land. It's kind of like oh, oh, oh don't look at it, don't look at it. And of course, you don't need to be frightened of it because in fact it's 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 the most beautiful place to be, you know. But it's it's people's kind of preconception of yeah. what it was. And I think another key difference is um, you know that Barbie Margot every day she gets up, she does the same thing, she throws the covers back out with. Weird Barbie, she doesn't. You know, she is something in a blender. You know, so the difference for us was that the house has evolved as she has evolved into those weird shapes. And also knowing then that it's Kate McKinnon playing it and how to do it, we had a, we created this like big, we called it the Pandora's box, which we, you know, made lots of things we put into. They weren't necessarily scripted. They all went into the box and it all came out. And she, we shot many things that Kate would take all sorts of things out and, including in the end, I think you see the clacker thing that goes like that and the snow globe, which has her own house in it. And I think in the map that came the down, map that comes down yeah. the big model of Barbie land. Um, and I think it's the impromptu nature of weird Barbie that you can't, you can't pigeonhole her, which is very different. So it was much more organic, even though it was still in essence, a Barbie doll and a Barbie dream house. But yeah, all the rejected, all the rejected Barbie. Yeah. Fascinating. I, I definitely felt like the German expressionism when I was looking at yeah. the set, yeah. very yeah. cabinet of Dr. Calgary and the very slanted angles and the weird angles and all that. And also you might see a little bit of Psycho House in yeah. there as well yeah. at the top of the hills. Yeah. So, of course. Yeah. And then like even even all the stuff about how handcrafted and artistic uh, weird Barbie's houses yeah. in comparison to all the yeah. other dream houses, you know, the dream houses feel very manufactured, very yeah. much like a toy, very simple. But then with Weird Barbie, you have splashes of colors and handmade crafted models and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So beautiful work. And I love I love uh, her first costume as well. Yes, that pink you know, baby Barbie doll. Baby dress. doll. Yeah, I yeah. love that. Mm. Absolutely brilliant. That's Jacqueline, a mm. phenomenal costume designer. Yeah. Okay, my next question is concerning Ken's Mojo Dojo Casa House. And my question is, how did you pick the different elements and the different stuff that would come together to create the interior and the exterior of the Mojo Dojo Casa House? Well, Ken was a bit of a relief, actually, to get to, as you say, we've created everything. And we know that, that you know, Ken brought, you know, the real world in on his shoot, just sort of like, you know, 25-man tandem or whatever. <laughs> um, and, you know, Greta had written that, you know, that that really it is he loves horses. And, of course, then you have um, the Lazy Boy sofas and all of that and the mini fridges. And the big thing, I think, was saying to Greta... Are you sure you want to go this ugly? You know, are you sure you want to go this ugly? She said, yeah, 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 I want to go this ugly. It has to. And so you know on the on the, on the the sort of narrative journey of the environment, this is going to happen to the dream house. So it was just a lot of fun, really. It was just, a, and it's the juxtaposition of things against, you know, that there was no black, there was no chrome, there was no TVs like that in, in the dream, in Barbie's dream house. I know you could bring all that in. Was the fun of it? Yeah, I think. yeah. And the and the Hummer and the Hummer. Yeah, yeah. And what he did to the cars. You and right. what? Yeah. So so it was just um, and it was done. It was done with no aesthetic mm. to it. You know, there was no. It was stuck on. You know, so it's not. It, it did. Applied, it was a it? yes. It was it 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 was. It didn't get dirty. It didn't get like you know like, but it just became. It was like it was like so he he just he. Everything was considered still, but yeah. um, he just would push Barbie's stuff aside and just, here goes my mini fridge, yeah. and here goes this, and here goes that. And we've spoken about the beauty that is in the, all the television showing the same footage. I, mean, yeah. I really like that, because I think yeah. it's really melancholy. Yes, I think, I think it's, it's, it's kind of anti-design in a mm. way, and yet there's something very you know, very beautiful, I think, about the, mm-hmm. you know, with all the big TV screens and, you know, there's no walls to put the TVs up on, so you put them on the chimney or you put them in the garden or something like that and it's just kind of uh, so kind of weirdly coincidental. Mm-hmm. I quite like that. 
It was a lot of fun. I, I loved I, I loved what you guys did in this film. Uh, that brings me to the next question, which is a question that is not really related that much to, you know, set designing or production designing and set decorating. But I did read in an interview where basically Greta Gerwig confirmed that the montage at the end of the movie features the friends and family of the cast and crew. My question is, were some of your friends and family featured in that montage? No. <laughs> that, that was all shot in post in America. Well, so, gathered in post because it, 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 yeah. it is all existing footage mm -hmm. from from cast and crew. Yeah, but um, it was it was to be in theory shot, and I just think we were all going, well, when are they ever going to have yeah. the time to shoot that? And of course, <laughs> the correct thing to do was do what she actually did, yeah. which was to which was gather, which yeah. was to gather the footage, which is what gives it that really authentic yeah. feel. Fair enough. Okay, that was a quick answer. Okay. Let's <laughs> move right on to question number nine. So uh, question number nine is, what advice would you give to young creatives around the world who want to pursue careers in production designing and set decorating? I think, I mean, if they want to get into the business, I think, um, I think be aware that it's, you know, it's really hard work, um, you know, and right now we're going through a difficult time because the industry has come to a juddering standstill because of the strikes. Um, so be aware of the ups and downs, work hard, but, you know, be tenacious. I think. I think. I, I think it's, it's a brilliant job. Yeah, it's I think as well. I think it's about. It's about kind of. It's almost like saying yes to everything. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like you know, if your friend is making a movie and they say, "Oh, will you do?" And you just do it. You know, and and you know, as long as it's safe in every sense of the word, you know, you just say yes and and go out and and you know, you never know where that will lead you to. You never know mm. what experience you're going to have. And you know, I mean, it's like. You know, in a way, you know, you find the people that you find the best people that you work with. Like, you know. I, I think so. And I think, you know, it's it's getting into the industry. You can train and train and train and then you get into the industry. So if you, you find like, you, OK, I want to work in sound, but, you know, there's an opportunity here to go in as a runner in production. Mm -hmm. Take it mm -hmm. because then you can still get to know the sound department or whatever department you want to be in. I find you might not I want find to you go, might, you know, people come in and go, sound. I didn't know that job existed. So. Say yes, get your yeah. way in. Yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah. And keep, you know, don't be blinkered. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Thank you. Now, the last question to wrap all this up is a more personal question. And my last question will be, you know, out of every movie you've watched, what would you say are your favorite sets? You know, the sets that really inspired you to pursue this careers. Okay, I've got, I've got, I've got, I remember as a child watching uh, Dr. Shivago on TV and watching the snow datcher, you know, where the, and I just thought that was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. I just thought it was like so magical. Later on, another favorite film of mine would be Woman of Affairs, which is a talent movie with, with Greta Garber. I just think that's it's beautiful. And I d don't disregard very, very early movies because yeah. they were brilliant. Yeah, and in fact, I'm kind of Powell and Pressburg considered, because, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the Red Shoes is just... Yeah. You're absolutely going yeah, to yeah mm. totally i mean it's interesting you talk about dodge of argo and we, you know we you know in, a, in virtually every film we do that reference will always end up on the wall with ah. but in fact on oh, anna karenina we did we did that didn't we with the snow it was yeah. the train that we made look like yeah we looked, and we yeah. looked at the way that they did that which were they shot in spain that mm. that thatcher and they did it with wax yeah. and so that's how we did the train in anna karenina we did it all covered it all in wax and oh, you know yeah. so so, you know, there's always, you know, reasons. You reasons. always come back yeah. to your favorite films. Everybody does. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, for me, uh, it just has to be um, Ken Adams and the, the early Bonds. I mean, they are just absolutely stunning. And our homage to him in, in Barbie uh -huh. is in Weird Barbie with the map that comes yeah. down. Yeah. Right. Because, you know, I mean, OK, in, in is it Doctor No or whatever, it spins and mm -hmm. it turns like that. And you have this giant map and it explains it everything. The table or whatever. It yeah. flips the table. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we had the one that came out the wall and it explains everything, you know, and it's just like, you know, um, I quite like that. So Ken Adam does Weird Barbie. It's quite good. Ken Adam does Weird <laughs> Barbie. Yeah. Biggest, biggest compliment I can pay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I can't believe I missed that. But yeah, you're completely right. OK, we all got some great movie recommendations yeah. for everyone watching this right now. And I'll definitely go home and watch some of these movies. Yeah. Anyway, Sarah and Katie, thank you so much for joining us today. This Pleasure. truly means a lot. And thank you all so much for watching. That has been all. Goodbye. <laughs>